thrilled to be here um, with all of you and uh, welcome any questions you have about anything. I want to preface that I am not a production sound mixer. I get all the results of all the production sound mixing that happens on all these features and I have to deal with all the problems. And this is not to put blame on anybody at all. It's, it's to stress that sound is a collaboration of a lot of people. And also, I'm, I'm hoping that there's a lot of you directors and independent filmmakers out there because really the, the, the point of the getting good sound is going to come from you. You as the filmmaker are the only one who can ensure getting great sound for your film. Why do we say that? I thought it was the mixer who gets great sound. No, it's you. You're the, you're the head of the production. Everybody's going to take their cues from you. And getting good sound recording is everyone on the set's job from the, the guy who's doing the cables to the DP to the craft services. Everybody should be aware that anything that they do is going to affect the sound. You as all independents know when you get into the editing room what happens. You're listening to all the sound problems that you probably never even heard or was aware of during the shoot. Because I know I'm a writer director. I get on a set and everything's about getting the picture. And um, even for me, and I have lots of experience as a sound, you know, getting all the sound from production. And usually all the sound problems come from everyone except the sound department. Uh, I have a little flow chart here that shows the organization by department. This is thanks to Doug Vaughn, who's a boom operator extraordinaire and is also a current instructor at U USC. And he kindly gave me this chart. This is every department on the set. And the next slide is, these are the ones who are responsible for capturing the picture. So you can see there's a lot of people responsible for the picture. Here's the people responsible for the sound. <laughs> Three little orange boxes, the production mixer, the boom operator, and, and a, cap, a cable second boom. So again, here's all the people responsible for picture. Here's the people responsible for sound. So look at some of these departments. I mean, even, you know, hair and makeup, costume designer, key grip, gaffer, electrical crew, you know, the grip crew, special effects, rainmakers, wind machines, all that stuff. And here's the sound people. <laughs> We're often relegated to a, a dark, dusty corner of the set. Some people don't even know that the mixer is there. They know the boom operator, and the boom operator is the person responsible for capturing the sound and the mixer is responsible for mixing it. So people do see the boom operator on the set. All right, here's the, all the people who can impact the soundtrack, right? They can make noise. The costumes can make noise. The, some of the art direction, if you'd only have single pane glass in a studio you're shooting in, that you might get a lot of traffic noise. Drivers, transportation, props, set decoration. The director, the, the assistant director, the producer, okay? If you guys have seen Singing in the Rain, recently. <laughs> That's a great movie to tell you about all the sound problems that could happen, including the producer walking on the set and pulling a cable, which was attached to the actress, who then falls on her, on her butt. Okay. <laughs> so, what we have is how sound is today. Most people think of sound as just a hocus-pocus, you know, it, it has to be done, it's a necessary evil, and it's, it's really not that difficult. You aim a mic at somebody's voice, and they say their dialogue, it gets recorded. There, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So what's interfering with the recording of good sound? Oh my gosh, there's so many things. There's the, the cables, the, the you know, even the lights can interfere with getting good sound if the lights are not placed right where you're going to get a boom shadow. We are now in an age of digital sound. We used to be on analog and people recorded for years and years on Nagras, on quarter inch tape, and 24 track. Now we can do it with a $300 machine and a and a $100 mic if you're really low budget. We'll get into mics a little bit later. And, and I think because of digital, I think it gives people a, a sense of apathy about their involvement in it. So what I'm really stressing today is that sound is an inseparable part of performance. And once you get that, once you get that sound is part of performance, think about you know your actors speaking lines of dialogue conveying the story, if they're not on, you know, if they're not saying things clearly or it's not being recorded well, you end up with big problems. And maybe you have very expensive actors. You do not want to put 
you know, a $300 lavalier on them when you could use a $3,000 boom microphone. So I want to stir up your sense of fear about sound. Sound is not scary. It's, it's a necessary part of your production. Okay, so here's the problems that we, we face on a, on a set. The sound crew is doing their best to, to capture good sound. Sometimes they, if they don't even get a rehearsal, they don't know where they can plant microphones if they need to. The mixer's contribution to the set can't be seen while on the set. You're going to see it and hear it in the editing room for sure, and I know a lot of you will attest to that. Well, you get in the editing room and, with your beautifully shot picture, and you say, oh my goodness, what happened to our sound? And I put the headphones on once, it sounded okay to me. So you want to you wanna monitor, you as the director, want to monitor the sound to make sure it sounds on mic and not off stage. And when, it, when I say our job to monitor the sets, it's really like the uh, us as the filmmakers, we need to monitor the sets and everybody involved needs to help in that area. And getting, getting these problems solved should be a cooperative effort. Good sound cannot be achieved without set disruptions and added costs. That's false. A lot of people think that. They think that, oh, you know, if we, we can't wait for sound all the time. Really? Really, you can't wait for sound. You can't wait for the tail end of an airplane to go by uh, before you roll. I mean, these things are, you, you must put it in your brain to be the one to change this attitude that's gone on for too long because we can't afford to keep doing all the fixing it in post. I mean, we can, but you, you, it has consequences. So my, my mission now is to help people fix it on the set, and it'll save you so much money and time, and, and you'll be happy because you'll, you'll capture good performances from your actors on mic. Wow, what a, what a, what a relief. <laughs> so you can capture good sound without set disruptions and added costs, and we'll, we'll get into that too. Limitations of equipment. Sometimes if you're off shooting somewhere and you can't uh, get a mixer and cables and all that stuff, there are other solutions. At least if you capture camera sound, which I know a lot of us are shooting with DSLRs and Canon 5Ds and 7Ds, and you, you know, they don't have any mic inputs, although I think the new ones might have mic inputs. Not sure about that. But I'm going to show you how to do it without the mic inputs. As long as you re can record camera sound, and some other sound source, there are solutions. So most good sound can be often achieved by using reasonable preparation. And reasonable preparation would be to possibly have your sound editor actually go to the set. What a concept. That means you must think about them ahead of time. One of my favorite directors, Mark Rydell, who did on Golden Pond, The River, The Rose, For the Boys, many, many great movies that I had the pleasure of working on with him and my mom. He was a big believer in giving sound its place because he knew that performances that are recorded well are the ones most often uh, are the best. To try to redo them with on a looping stage or using wild tracks, uh, you know, is a, is a, a, poor, a poor second solution to, to the problem. And he would call my mom months in advance before he even knew who the actors were to secure her services on his films and uh, because he, he cared that much about it. And he sent her and a recordist to Tennessee on the river to record all the, all the sounds of the farm, the smelting plant, anything that was there, the tractors, the ambiences. Because, you know, on, on location, the production mixer is working six days a week he or she does not want to use their seventh day to go out and record sound effects for some editor three months down the road. But Mark knew that this was important to gather those sounds while they were there shooting in Tennessee. So he sent my mother and another recordist and they captured a library of usable sounds that were indigenous to that movie. So they got the tractors, they got the trucks, they got the farm equipment, they got the corn fields, they got the cicadas in the corn fields, they got the smelting plant, and they even got some of the flooding that they had to do on the farm using rain machines, but they got all the flooding. And that was a big help in, I think, what helped to win her her Oscar was the use of these indigenous sounds. I mean, yes, you can send somebody out later to try to record them, but why not do it at the time 
and get the most out of your most bang out of your buck. So it used to be that, you know, in the studio system that people kind of came up through the ranks and, you know, people cared about all the different crafts responsibilities. You know, now there isn't a, an apprenticeship program. People just kind of, hey, let's hire Cousin Bob to hold the boom and, and here, record this. Uh, I mean, we've all done that on, you know, very little money and, and that's fine. But teach Cousin Bob how to, how to use the boom to get the best sound. Uh, which means he has to pay attention to the story. He has to move the boom back and forth from the actors to make sure they're both on mic. Anyway, we'll, hopefully we'll get to that too. There's there's so much I can say. I, I get bogged down in like all my, I want to tell you everything all at once. So I'm trying to be organized here. Okay, we want to get the other people in the crafts department to help in the prevention of sound problem. Even to where to put the generator and to point the exhaust away from the set. And most of the other departments, as in my flowchart there, uh, work for what is seen and not heard. I mean, think about all the preparation that goes into uh, a set, you know, the, the uh, design of the set, the location of the set. I, I worked on a film, uh, Ordinary People, with uh, Robert Redford directing at one Best Picture that year, but that sound was, uh, location was chosen as a aluminum warehouse near an airport for the psychiatrist's office. Now here you have these very delicate scenes between the psychiatrist Judd Hirsch and Timothy Hutton, who is a, a a struggling young you know young man who'd lost his brother in a boating accident and was rift with survivor guilt. So here you have these very sensitive scenes with aluminum popping and cracking when it would heat up, and airplanes going by. So. No fault of the mixer, he was trying to preserve what he could, so he turned down the volume on his mixer to reduce the ambient background noise, and we, when we got it as editors, we had to raise it all back up again, creating a very loud noise floor with, with nothing to hide behind. When you're doing a basically dialogue-driven movie, you, you can't hide behind explosions and car crashes and you know guns going off. It's just you and that dialogue and maybe some ambience. So you have to be very careful about getting rid of extraneous little noises, which then tell you that you're watching a movie. So a lot of people say, oh, well, it doesn't matter, you know, if we don't get the sound right, we'll just ADR it or loop it. And, you know, I'm, uh, I love being able to help a performance with looping. I worked on Speed, the movie, not the drug, just to be clear, um, and on Speed, it was a director's choice to shoot on a moving bus so that the energy would be in the actor's performances. And he was told at the time that, you know, if you're going to do that, you're not going to tow the bus. You're actually going to have the bus moving. Um, you'll probably have to loop the whole scene. And I think at that point he didn't realize what that meant, but <laughs> he uh, found out later. And we ended up looping everything on the bus, the, including the main actors and the background people, and it, they were able to create and hone in on performances that weren't there in production. Usually it's the other way around. The production is considered the key performance, and ADR is just a necessary evil to help it, you know, to fix it. I mean, we have a lot of tools nowadays, even as editors, to fix bad, noisy scenes. We have isotope, we have waves, we have a lot of plugins that we can use I've always tended to leave the noise reduction to the mixers because they have many more many more tools than uh, we can use in plugins, but I'm also finding that they don't often have the time to mix and to work on these scenes. They're not given enough time in the mix to go through and, and get rid of background noises. And ideally, if you could edit the whole movie and then take it to a mixer and see what noises they could get out, and then loop or ADR what's left, you would have a very happy director, a very happy actors, because then they're only doing what's necessary to loop. Anyway, ADR is not evil, and it can be used to help increase uh, understandability, and it could be good for replacing scenes that have too much noise. I mean, think about wind and rain machines because rain and wind are very constant noise, it's kind of like a white noise, sometimes you can get that out with noise reduction. But it does affect the voice. So that's always the key, is that you're always protecting the voice, because you can always add sounds 
in later. You can't take them out necessarily. So think, as a filmmaker, you want to think very singularly about the sound because you can add, like don't play music on a set, uh, even if you're going to have music later. You can play it at first to give people kind of a level of where it's going to be in the mix and then turn it off and let it let the actors do the scene as if they're talking above music. Um, see, I digress. It's just my nature. <laughs> <laughs> so great consequences with looping come with artistic compromise oftentimes. You, you can get good performances from ADR if you, as the director, are behind doing it. There are some directors who just hate looping and that, that hate passes on to their actors so they don't get very good loops, therefore it reinforces their hate of looping. But if the director goes in and says, you know what, we're going to do this really well, you know, we're going we're gonna to match these performances, we're going to even improve the performances, you know, let's go for it. And then everybody's in the same boat. Um, and why do we end up ADRing? Uh, we end up ADRing because people have been uh, overlapping, like in, in close-up coverage. Let's say you do a master shot first, and then you do a shot of John, and then a shot of Mary. And in John's close-up, Mary's overlapping him, but she's off mic. If she consistently overlaps him, I mean, first of all, you say don't overlap during the close-ups, but if she's consistently overlapping, then slap a mic on her, so at least she's on mic for an overlap, because you can't match an off mic sound with an on mic sound and have it sound very good. So that would be a help for that. ADR can lose the energy of the scene if it's not recorded properly. I mean, ADR, you're dealing with performance, sync, and projectability, meaning it has to match the same level and energy. I make, I make people run around the room, I make them do push-ups, I, I have them push against a, a static object if they're doing that kind of motion in the scene. Let's say they're pushing something uphill. I'll stand next to them and say, okay, push against me because that gets in their voice when they're pushing something uphill. Or if they know how to do that vocally, we let them do that. But a lot of times they just, they get a little scared. You're on a, a bare stage. You got beeps, you know, through, through the headphones. You're not working with other actors and you have to get yourself in that mindset. And you, you as the director, need to help the actors do that, to recreate that performance. And yes, post-budget funds can be much better spent than doing a lot of unnecessary ADR. And when I say unnecessary, I mean because of our schedules, we don't have the luxury to just edit, take it to a mixed stage, see what can be fixed, and then loop what's left. We're oftentimes trying to outguess or second-guess whether the mixer can fix something or not, and so we put it down on our looping sheets to do it. We bring in the actors. Everybody takes a lot of time. And then at the end, it turns out, oh, they didn't really have to loop it because they can clean it up pretty well. So those are the things you have to weigh as a director. And it's also going to sound different. You know, a loop is going to sound different than production. And I think what happens is we, when we edit film, you know, the director and the editor listen to performances over and over and over, and it kind of gets embedded in your brain that way you know, the timing, the nuances, the inflection. It's just like when you listen to a, you know, your favorite music group uh, on, on a CD or MP3 player, whatever you're listening to these days, and then you go to a live concert and you hear the same song that you've been listening to over and over and it's played live and it's like, oh no, that's not, that's not the right inflection. They're doing it differently. I don't like it. So you want to you wanna take off that kind of set in your ears feeling when you listen to anything new in a movie. Sometimes that includes sound effects. Uh, as an example, on Evan Almighty, we gave the director, Tom Shadiak, and his editor, we gave them some sound effects of the animals that eventually would be there through C a CGI, and the editor put them right in to his uh, edit so that the director would get used to hearing them over and over. And once you do that, you know, you put music or sound effects to, to your, fi your film, it becomes embedded in that way forever. Uh, if you're going to shoot with a 12-year-old boy, <laughs> make sure that you get any, any needed ADR that you might want to get. Get it as soon as possible after you, after you finish shooting because their voices are going to change <laughs> in three or four months whenever you get it as the sound editor. And then 
the main thing is make sure that audio problems can't be fixed on the set. That's really crucial because if it can be fixed on the set, that's where you want to fix it. Okay. The majority of events that ruin soundtracks are predictable. So that means like cables, that means clothing. Sometimes I think we have a slide on, on clothing a little bit later. Uh, the difference between getting good sound and bad sound is how it's handled on the set. Again, you as the filmmaker need to stress how important getting good sound is to all the departments and, and let the sound mixer be your advocate. If Give them time to plant a mic, find the right uh, area that's going to be, uh, if you have to hang a, a little wireless mic in a, in a place or put it on per a person, it's always preferable to use a boom mic rather than lobs. We'll get into that too. Good sound comes from anticipating the outcome. So think about your film, even at the script level, think about how it's going to sound when it's mixed. I know that seems like a long way off when you're in pre-production and you're dealing with all kinds of other things. But, you know, let the mixer in on your thinking. Get the sound editor on the set because there's nothing as valuable as, as a sound editor on a set. They might be annoying to the production mixer, but, you know, we all know that it's important for everybody to be on the same page. And this one's really crucial. If you read the script, you know, and this was a hint from uh, Doug Vaughn again, a, a, a great uh, boom operator. If you highlight the scenes in the script where the meat of the story is in the dialogue as opposed to action, let's say two guys are running down the street and one yells to his brother, get down, he has a gun. You know, ADR will probably not ruin your movie. If, on the other hand, the scene is a guy kneeling over his dying brother saying, I'm so sorry, man, I didn't know he had a gun. You know, pick another location where you can get that dialogue safely recorded. And, you know, action scenes can always be ADR because there's lots of energy in the scene to hide the fact that it's ADR. So make sure you shoot intimate, important dialogue scenes that are, you know, in a noisy place. Shoot, you know, maybe move, uh, move the set over a little bit to some trees or something where you can have some intimacy. You can always add sounds. You can't always take them away. Locations. Location, location, location. Most people go to um, a set and they say, oh, oh, it's so beautiful. But imagine like sticking your fingers in your ears and going, wow, what a look. So <laughs> that means that the, the set looks good, but it sounds horrible. So you as the filmmaker need to go to locations and just kind of listen to what the noise floor is in that place. Is it, are there lots of airplanes going by? Are there you know, is there traffic? Are there, is there a school that lets out at, you know, three o'clock and all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of noisy kids going down the street? You really want to kind of pre, pre-test it. You really want to get creative. Take your Zoom recorder and your, or your camera, your little camcorder, and go out there and just record some ambience. And that's the noise floor that your actors are going to have to fight against. And if that's okay for you, again, it's, as long as you're armed with information, you can make informed decisions. You know, one time on a, a Peter Bogdanovich film, he sent the production mixer to the location, which was about a half a block from the 101 freeway. And when the mixer got there, he put his fingers in his ears and said, oh, yeah, man, what a look. <laughs> Cause, and, and Peter nixed the location, which was the location manager was very upset about. But Peter cared about getting good sound recording. Yeah, so you want to always listen to that noise floor and, and decide, is the location still worth it? I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make is complacency and, and trust that your sound mixer will just magically record everything perfectly without any support from you. Don't leave them off in that little corner, you know. Get involved, because once your, your whole crew sees that you care enough about the sound, they will care about the sound as well, and they'll start getting more creative with how to control problems. And just a hint from my own experience, if you're shooting in, a, in, a, in an office uh, with a running refrigerator and you've turned it off, put your keys in the refrigerator to remind you to turn it back on. Otherwise, the people that rented you the space will, won't, won't have a, a puddle of water melted from the ice in the refrigerator, okay? <laughs> Learn from my mistakes. And see, so we got control of air conditioning, other noise makers air that's blowing, neon, avoid, you know, our fluorescent lights are a killer to soundtracks because they just constantly buzz. 
and try schedule filming for non-work times like at bars or locations maybe in the middle of the night where it'll be quieter. Avoid tin roofs and creaky wooden floors. I, I had one director say to me, well, why should we avoid creaky floors? You're just going to put it in in Foley. And, and that is true. We can put stuff back in, but we can't always take it out. And the, the goal of good sound recording is to make sure that the voice of the actors is the most predominant sound you hear at a consistent level. That's the goal. Communicate with the electrical department. A lot of times we'll get, you know, cables crossing and buzz being created. Even all the little walkie-talkies on the set and cell phones, they all contribute to the noise floor if those things are not taken care of. If you have to pay your production mixer to go to the location to approve it, it's well worth the money. Don't rely on the production designer's assessment of the location for sound because they're, they are in a different department and they're an expert in their field of the look. But it's up to us as the filmmakers to make sure the sound location is good as well. Production sound has a production value. One of my favorite mixers is uh, Jim Webb, who is retired, and, uh, but he has done so much for the sound industry. He's done just amazing work of getting production sound and not having to loop things. If you look at the film Long Riders, there's a scene on a running stagecoach, and he was hiding in the back of the stagecoach with his mixer and recording the sound live on the moving stagecoach with the horses going, you know, really fast and uh, all the noise of their equipment and such and you can hear every word of dialogue it wasn't looped and it has a production value one of his famous sayings is put on the scapegoat suits we're going in <laughs> meaning you know a lot of times people will blame the sound you know oh we're waiting on sound things like that and we're always the brunt of jokes but really we're very very important you as the filmmaker again will be the one who should be demanding getting good sound don't leave it to the poor production mixer to fight your battles you got to you got to join in and take part of the responsibility art department a lot of times they'll they'll make it hard to have a set that's not noisy so whenever possible carpet sets double pane windows Consider using overhead mics and, and make sure that you're, you as a sound department is communicating with the art department. Wardrobe. This is an, another big one because of using body mics. Make sure that you use cotton is your friend. Silk is your enemy. Why is that? Because silk is very noisy and you'll get a lot of, you know, just shuffling of microphones against the silk and, and it will ruin performance. And remember that the good sound is inseparable with good performance. Creative placing of wireless mics. Sometimes you can even plant a mic above an actor's head if they're crossing through a doorway or something. You know, they don't always have to be on the body. Ask actors to avoid silk underclothes. Avoid silk ties. Consider the impact of sound when choosing jewelry. I did a show once where the actress, part of her character was to have this very, very noisy bracelet and it just chomped on all the dialogue and we had to record a lot of the ADR because it was so loud. So that's something that the mixer will be able to hear but he or she will have to talk to the wardrobe department and say hey can we can we do it a different way and still have it look good for you. This was a story told by, by um, Doug. I don't I didn't work on this but he did. On LA Story Sarah Jessica Parker was playing this very quirky character and she wore a very tight wardrobe and during the rehearsal, the boom, the boom operator, Doug, noticed that one of her character traits was that she would spin around and talk so that there was nowhere to hide the transmitter because you would see every, every angle of her. So he went to the wardrobe department, and together they figured out to put a fanny pack on her, and they hid the transmitter in there, and they got good sound for the rest of the shoot. It's all about collaboration and give and take. Talk to the other departments with the attitude of, help me figure out how to solve this. Don't just go in and whine about the problems. Be cooperative and collaborative. Um, the assistant directors, really crucial on a set. They must, must support the sound on your film. When they say lock it up, they mean don't allow walking or talking on the set or in the background. You know that movies are all about hurrying, hurrying up and waiting. And so all the people who've hurried to make the set ready to shoot, you know, are, are going to make noise when it's not their turn to work. So they have to protect the sound. 
allow, allow sound department to make corrections without announcing, we're waiting on sound. I mean, most of the time we're waiting on picture, we're waiting for lighting, we're waiting for sets. So, but why, why again, do we become the scapegoats? I think just because they don't know what else to say. So don't let the assistant director say that because fixing a sound problem is just as important as fixing a light. Enforce silent pantomiming from extras because we want to make sure that the loop group later on down the line gets to put the voices in all those people's mouths. So we want silent pantomiming of real words too, but silent. Again, we can add sounds and we can control the levels by adding sounds. I think I forgot to mention about the Foley before of, you know, wooden creaky floors. The difference is that the creak isn't married to the actor's voice. And if we put it in in Foley, we always have control over the levels. Allocate reasonable time for actors to get wired for sound. Make sure the boom operator gets to see at least one rehearsal. And uh, rehearsals are very, very important because this way the boom operator gets to see, oh, this person's walking from left to right. Uh, I have to figure out, or they're going out a door or something. They need to figure out what's the action, who's talking, where can I get in the mic where I won't be seen. Make sure that the assistant director honors room tone requests before breaking the set. One of my pet peeves is, this is, how a, uh, this is how a wild track of room tone goes. Okay, we're going to do a wild track, wild track of room tone. Okay, quiet on the set, quiet on the set. We're going to do room tone. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, the slate of the room tone is longer than the room tone because people are very uncomfortable with silence. But silence is also a sound and a usable sound that we need as production dialogue editors to use room tones when we need them. If there's a problem, like there's a neon buzz or fluorescent light buzz, having enough of that clean buzz sound can actually help us in the end, not hurt us. Because in order to make sounds sound smooth, we have to cover the offensive sound with more offensive sound, in other words, to get rid of it. In plane or traffic infested locations, roll as the engine noise tails off. Inform sound department at least two days ahead of playback because they need to get ready for a playback. Have all walkie-talkie cell phones turned off. Every new setup, announce what kind of shot will take place. Whether it's a master shot or a close-up, that helps the boom operators. Production managers. They should budget in a third sound person and a proper audio equipment. And we're going to talk about expensive audio equipment and cheap audio equipment at the end of this. Uh, consider the post budget when making financial decisions. I can't tell you how many times I've been booked on a show and I come in and they say, oh, you know, we spent our sound budget on the helicopters to get everybody to the set. It's like, well, am I supposed to work on it for free? So you need to factor in post budget sound when making your budget. Make sure that stages are quiet. If you're doing a scene where you've created a set like a house, you know, in a, a bedroom or a kitchen or something, Put some kind of ceiling above it because there's nothing worse than pretending you're in a house when you hear the sound echo through the big tall stage. So have something overhead that's going to buffet the sound a little bit. Soundproof warehouses stage when, when used. I mean, I've, I've gotten sound from uh, legitimate sound stages that they haven't done a ceiling kind of sound and, and now you have reverb and echo going out, especially if people are using loud voices or yelling camera department. So we got the camera assistants that their job would be to help contain camera noise. I mean there are some cameras that are just noisy but there are ways to get around that using some blankets. I know Jim, Jim Webb used uh, blanketing material to put over the exhaust of the generator or at least in front of it and, and around the camera and uh, don't turn the slate on and off because that, that gets rid of the time code matching. Let sound mixer know what frequencies are being transmitted from the camera. And hold only the frame size to be used. That's really important. I think I have a slide about that. Communicate and work out any problems with the boom operator. Be willing to cooperate in a pinch, which means help, help us with the sound. Camera department director, DPs, they should not ever put a, a light to boom the operator offset because then he'll be off mic. Do not use xenon lights. Do not say loop it because it's not your job. Consider the sound problems. Again, it's all about cooperation. We don't want to blame people. Okay, so this is a little diagram that I got from Doug Vaughn 
So the, the, the V line, you can see where the little boom operator guy is in the actors, and you see where the frame line is. So anything that's within that frame line, and any lamp in that zone is going to throw its shadow outside of the frame, which is good. If you look at the bottom, it says any lamp in this zone will cause a shadow. So if you have lights behind the camera, it's going to make a shadow for that boom operator, and then he can't get in, he or she can't get in close enough to record the actor's voices properly. So that's a really crucial thing to know, uh, especially for independent filmmakers. Remember, it's not all about the, what you see in the camera, it's also about what you hear. So special effects. We want to keep the offstage noise making devices away from set. Consider the sound problems when making rain. Muffle the raindrops. Uh, on my document actually said using hog's hair, which <laughs> I don't even know what that is, like real hog's hair, but you can check that out. This document is also available if you, you can email me or Moviola Digital. We can get you this document. It's called an open letter from your sound department, and it's written by a lot of people with a lot of experience, and I've contributed to that as well. Work with the sound mixer when fans are being used. Limit gas hissing when using fireplaces. Heaters on cold sets need to be shut down. So does air conditioning has to be turned off if it's hot. Props, you know, make sure that guns, you know, if they have a quarter load or something, it's always good to, to record the guns with quarter loads because then we top that with a sound effect and it makes it sound real. Table scenes do anything to muffle dish clattering. That's hard to say. Um, use fake ice cubes and drink glasses. And it's all really because these kind of sounds and spray shopping bags with a water mixture to make them less shopping baggy sounding. You want to tamp, tamp down the sounds that might overpower a voice. And also with actors, especially young actors, you want to teach them to pick things up and set things down when they're not talking. So it's like, hello, I'm going to the store, you know, and you put something down after store. You don't put it down on top of store. And most adult actors know that, but if you're working with kids, you have to kind of educate them. Grip department. Using cutters to kill boom shadows. That can help. And uh, reduce dolly squeaks on, uh, on dollies. Sound blankets to deaden sound. I mean, this is all pretty, you know, intuitive stuff if you think about it. But that's the point. You have to think about it. Uh, baffle covers for loud set machines. Fasten down all scrims and gels that may rattle in the wind. Oh my gosh, that one is so, so important and it seems so simple and, uh, you know, intuitive, but uh, a lot of sound has been ruined by an offstage rattly, you know, gel that's just rattling like crazy and it gets all over the track. So if your mixer comes to you and says, you know what, I'm picking up, because remember, we're listening, the mixer on the set is listening through headphones to what the microphone is picking up. And microphones, depending on what their bandwidth is, can pick out a lot of stuff or a little stuff. If you have a very directional mic, you can aim it at a voice within a, uh, an ocean squall, and that voice will be clear and it will reject all the sound around it, but it has to be aimed properly. So I always suggest get a, an experienced sound mixer and boom operator. Even, even I have to pay for mixers to come and shoot stuff that I shoot because I, I want it to be done right. I don't want to have to, and I can redo it, but I want it done right the first time because that's where performances are. Electric department, keep generator at a distance and aim exhaust away from the set. Keep lights and ballasts from making noise on set. Run cables so doors and windows can close. That's really important because you can close out the sound. You don't want sound I worked on a film where they put the generator right outside the house, so every time somebody opened the door to go out, you would hear this big noise coming in, and then the door would shut part way, and the generator would still be there. So, you know, make sure you listen through headphones, because headphones and microphones are not subjective like our ears. You know, our ears can discriminate and, and kind of cancel out sounds we don't want to hear, like like your spouse yelling at you. If you don't want to hear that, you just tune it out, right? A microphone is going to pick up everything. Keep lights in, in, in silent, non-flicker free when shooting at 24 frames a second. And that is really important, otherwise you see that really flicker, the flicker effect. Craft service department, go away. <laughs> go away from the set, but make sure we have food nearby. Okay. <laughs> Transportation. Uh, push or pull vehicles with human power during close-ups, meaning you don't need to have the engine on. Park trucks and cars far away from set because people start them and move them. Park trucks in front of generators whenever possible, and that helps dampen the sound of the generator. 
use only one key in the ignition to eliminate that clanging sound of keys, unless it's a part of your story, of course. And uh, again, all sound, everything in a movie comes from the story. And I, I can't stress that enough either because, you know, we think, oh, as a sound person, you don't really care about the story or something. But no, the story is what drives every part of the filmmaking process. You know, if somebody is sneaking down a hallway, do we really want to hear their footsteps? You know, if we hear their footsteps, then the bad guy or the good guy is going to hear their footsteps, etc. So you want to think about the sound that's going to be in your, in your film. Actors. Good actors are loud actors to a mixer. And not necessarily loud like shouting, but there are some actors who, who love to talk really softly like this. And then they come in and they do looping later because then they can control the performance. So if an actor is not projecting loud enough for the scene, for the, the mixer to record it above the noise floor, that's really the, the key, is above the noise floor. If you go in your house and you're talking to your friend, then at the same level, go outside and see how much louder you're gonna talk just to accommodate the noise floor of the exterior location that you're at. Don't refuse to wear a mic when necessary. Um, a lot of actors will say, oh, I tell you, I don't want to have a mic on me. But, you know, if you're in a place where you need one, then put one on. Warn the sound department when you will do a much louder or quieter take than you rehearsed. I know of a mixer whose eardrums got blown out because during rehearsal, the actor was kind of whispering, and then when the director called action, suddenly he shouted, and the mixer had his pot way you know, way up to record the whisper, and it, it literally blew his eardrums out. So please inform the uh, mixer if you're going to do it differently than you rehearsed, and project when asked to. Um, this is one of my hints for directors that I got from Mark Rydell, and it's a really huge hint. Um, and what you do is you say, before you're ready to roll a take, or when you're ready to roll your take, you say, and action or and cut. So that little bit of pause in there gives, gives us as sound editors way down the road a little bit of quiet room tone where everybody is in the room because a, you know, a, a full room, a room full of people sounds different than a room where everybody's vacated. And that way the, uh, the whole set doesn't have to stop and wait while you're getting this wild track. It also gives you the room tone that's appropriate and indigenous to that particular take. Because if you're shooting in traffic, you know, 25 Apple Take 2 might sound different than 25 Apple Take 3 because the traffic is moving. So when you say this and action and cut, it really hel helps a lot, give us much needed uh, ambience, as well as it helps, I think, the set to know, oh, we're just about to do action, oh, we better freeze, we're just about to cut. Uh, and it's a really cool hint, it doesn't take up a whole lot of time. And collaborate frequently with your sound mixer so they can enrich your vision through sound images. That's really, it's just important to collaborate. Uh, can't stress that enough either. Find out what problems and solutions exist and then rehearse. Rehearse, rehearse. Rehearse with the actors, rehearse with the camera. You know, the camera operator needs to know and the focus puller needs to know what's going to happen in this, in this take. And the boom operator and the mixer will get a good chance to rehearse their moves because they're going to be chasing the, the dialogue as well. If you have actors at improv, you just have to kind of go by, the, by your instincts to catch them on mic or put lobs on them just in case. Sound is part of your entire filmmaking process from pre-production through post. And you need to know enough about sound as a director to sit there on the dub stage and make choices between ADR alternative takes, and production sound. The difference between good and bad sound on a set is only about five minutes a day, really. Some added tweaking, put some powder on dolly wheels, plant another mic, change a mic, quieted footsteps. Sometimes, you know, uh, we have the actors wear little hospital booties on their shoes. If their feet aren't going to be in the take, why do we need to hear their footsteps overpowering their dialogue? You know, a machine that comes on during a take, you know, trying to to kill it, silicone to a door squeak, a well-placed blanket. I mean, you just think about, you know, you just have to think about the sound. Okay, so this, I'm gonna show you some, some equipment that's relatively inexpensive, but necessary. This is a, for a DSLR, I have one of these for my, for my camera. It's a, from Beach Tech, 
It attaches right to the camera. It has mic inputs. It has XLR inputs. It's really good. It's about, I think, $300 or so. And I use a Zoom. Hey, you know, for, for another 300 bucks, you can get, it's got also XLR and quarter inch inputs, outputs, and it's a, a great way to get good sound, separate sound. I was talking about the difference between camera sound and separate recorded sound and using a program called Pluralize, which will help sync up separate camera sound with your camera sound, and it will improve your sound quality immensely. Sound devices, now if you got, you know, four, four or five thousand dollars to spend, this is what a lot of mixers are using. You can uh, read all that. It's, uh, there's also Diva. I'm not sure how much those are, but they're very high end. And the Clapper sounds best friend. Gosh, you know, for what, five bucks you can buy a Clapper somewhere and <laughs> it's the best way to sync camera sound to source sound. And you can even clap your hands as long as you're doing it very loudly and to the camera. Always voice slate, even when you're using a time-coded slate. You always want to say, 25 Apple, take two, mark, and then a good strong and fast clap. Because the camera can see that, Pluralize can, can take your camera sound and your separate recorded sound and sync that up and you use that to edit with. Um, talking about, you know, body mics and lavs. Relatively cheap transmitter recorder it's from Electrosonics. I use that in conjunction with a, a boom. So body mics versus booms. You always want to use a boom, I think, as much as possible. Because think about a, a if you have a professional mixer, he's got a $3,000 microphone versus a, you know, a $300 lav mic. But it's also important to use the right tool for the right job. We've discovered some male actor voices do better with a different mic than a woman's voice. Female voices do better with Sheps. Male voices are better with Sennheisers. Don't rely on body mics unless there's no other way to record the dialogue. I had the uh, opportunity to see both the Batman, you know, Dark Knight Rises and Les Mis. And both directors come at production sound because production sound has a production value. And they come at the saving production in two different ways. Christopher Nolan loves production sound. He does not like to loop. And um, this is not to put him down or anybody on the production, but I had a really hard time understanding Bane's dialogue, as I'm sure a lot of you did, because the director chose to have production as the source of that character's dialogue through the mask. I think that the production mixer tried to get a little mic into the mask to record it better because the goal was to put a lot of reverb and echo and make him a very scary character. But what it did was it made him not easy to understand. And that was frustrating, at least in the audience that I was with, which was, I think, a, a bunch of editors and Academy members. You know, it was very frustrating to, to try to understand the story through that dialogue. Les Mis, on the other hand, was an amazing feat of recording live dialogue, uh, recording the actors singing live which I don't think has been done quite like that uh, before. And it works for the movie. You always want to try to find the sound recording for the movie that you're making. I know in For the Boys and The Rose, both had big musical numbers in them that Jim Webb would replace the guts of, of an old-fashioned microphone with new guts to record Bette singing live in the uh, Vietnam sequence or Korean War sequence in For the Boys. And live recording is always great because you really you see the actors, you know, mouths move uh, and their breath and their inhales and you feel all that realness to it. And I think that's why Tom Hooper on uh, Les Mis wanted to do that. He wanted the actors to control the timing of the song versus the song controlling the actors. And he stayed in close up on Anne Hathaway for one for one of her songs, he stays on her face the whole song, and you you just see and hear everything that's live. And they did that by thinking about the sound ahead of time. They planted a little earbud in her ear, and then they they played off stage on an electric piano and sent the signal to the head to the, her little earbud, and so you wouldn't hear the tapping of the keys because it would re be replaced by orchestra. I mean, the other option is using playback, but again. If you watch Glee, it's all playback. You don't hear anything live from them, except once in a while, I think. You know, Christopher Nolan, he, he prefers using a single camera. And, and this is really important for, for all of us as filmmakers. When you have two cameras, 
you are essentially having a wide shot and a close-up. Where do you put the microphone if you're using a wide shot? You have to put it outside the frame. But now you have a close-up image with long shot sound, and it never sounds right. And really, when you think about it, how many seconds are you going to use that wide shot? <clears throat> Probably just a couple seconds, and yet the meat of your scene is the dialogue, and now the mic isn't there. So think about you know, why you want to use two cameras to shoot a scene and figure out with your mixer the best way to place the microphone. Because um, DPs can't always light for two cameras either, and neither can sound. Um, sound always ends up accommodating the wider shot because otherwise the mic will be seen. So we don't want that. Okay, so hopefully you can see this on your screen. Okay, this is a, uh, an example from a film that I'm working on the sound for a, a director friend of mine. These two tracks are, you know, one mic and the other mic. This mic goes for this character here, and this mic is for her in this wide shot. I can make that a little bigger, but um, I wanted to let, let you hear some of the problems. They were shooting on a hilltop with a very windy, but you see the wind in their hair, and it kind of works. I'm going to play this. See my tears as well. I offer them to you. Go ahead. Look at them. There is no need to raise your voice, Senora Ruiz. So you hear his, his dialogue. Raise your voice, Senora Ruiz. You know, it kind of comes up. You can see the waveform here that the mixer is... Need to raise your... You know, he, he said, oh, the guy's talking. I better raise his mic. So you can see the waveform goes up here. She's got uh, a lot of clipping or distortion. This is a program called Isotope, which helps to reduce the clipping. Um, well, I... I can... Uh, I'll just make a quick copy of this and run this through Isotope and it... Oh, valid audition path. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> I won't show that example because I nope. don't have time to do that. All right, but I want to show you what we can do within Pro Tools. Isotope is a really great program to help with de-clicking, de-popping. It will learn the noise floor of your scene and reduce the noise floor without hopefully interfering with the dialogue. You always want to protect the dialogue. But in Pro Tools, you can hear, if you hear this, I mean, this takes time to get accustomed to hearing things, but there's a little tiny pop Look at in her in her dialogue right there. You can hear that? If I blow it up big enough, I can see it. I can see it's right there. And, and what I can do with this pencil tool, well, first I'm going to duplicate it because uh, it, it's a destructive type of um, thing. Take that off. And I'll just render that. So now it's a copy, and I can always pull out the original. And then I just take my little pencil, and I just draw it out. I draw it the way I think it should be. And then when I play it again, that little click is not going to be there. Look at them. The clipping, the distortion is still there. Look at them. But now that little tiny click is not there anymore. Here, I'll play the difference. And, and those things, you know, when we do this kind of work, it's kind of like watching paint dry. <laughs> Because, you know, it can be uncreative, but when you're sitting in your little dark room editing this stuff and you're getting out all these kind of clicks and pops that, that will affect the audience subconsciously that you're watching a movie. Look and that, that. that's my goal is to make sure that they aren't there because then it, it, it kind of does the opposite of suspending your disbelief. It, it puts your belief back in like, oh, yeah, I'm watching a movie. So Look at them. There is no need. And, you know, this is a scene where I'm not sure if we're going to end up ADRing it or not, because to me, I, I don't mind the wind as long as I can hear the dialogue clearly the first time through, because you only, it's like you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And I have to tell directors that. They'll say, oh, that, that line of dialogue doesn't matter if, they, if the audience hears it or not. And I said, yeah, but they don't know that. So if they don't know that it's not an important line, they're going to turn to their friend in the audience and say, what do you say? And then you've lost them for about five seconds out of your movie. So my criteria for looping is, do we hear clearly enough a first-time viewing, 90 feet a minute, that's what film goes through in, the, in a theater, 90 feet a minute. If we don't hear it clearly, then it's a candidate for looping in my book, whether, whether it's an important line of dialogue or not. As well, I offer them to you. Go ahead. Look at them. There is no need to raise your voice. And you so there's another pop mm. right there. So... I hone in on it like a little beacon, <laughs> and there it is, that little spike. So again, I'm going to uh, just duplicate that, take my pencil tool, and just draw that right out. We used to have to cut these out, you know, on film, but you only had a, a quarter of a frame, one sprocket worth to, to take that out. Now we can 
go in and, and sample. So need to raise your voice, Senora Ruiz. So now that little pop is not there. Raise your voice. And oh, there's another one. And you know, after a while, you you start hearing them clearly. You can find them on the waveform, and you can take them out. And it, it just makes the experience of listening to the dialogue a little more um, pleasurable, and um, it doesn't take you out of you know the movie. So I understand we're going to wrap up here and hopefully take your questions and um, I'm really excited to have shared all this information with you and there's a whole lot more but we're gonna get to questions I think. Now it's time to ask you a lot of questions Victoria. <laughs> number, okay, number, one, on. number one, thank you. you know, we're gonna have to do like part two. <laughs> okay. no, it's, it's really, I mean. All right, it, I know there's a lot of there information. Was like, there was part one, there was a lot of you know all those pre-production and production but we had just just started getting into fixing in the post. So we're going to have to do part two if you ever have the time, bring you back on, on fixing sound problems in post, even though we stress you don't want to, but there are going to be times. You always have the, to fix stuff. And you know, in yeah. the audience that, that is listening out there, the ones uh, right now because of the poll question we've learned, um, there is a lot of, of no budget here. I mean, they don't have the electrical department. They don't have that production designer. They don't have the generator right out the uh, at the window. So a lot of the uh, um, the questions are are going to be about uh, the, trying to get the best damn sound we can on the littlest right. amount of money we can. So we don't have to bring all this stuff to you. Right. Well, you know, my my sound mantra, and this works for everything, from the set to the post, is if it sounds good, it is good. So if you're listening on your set and you've got you and the DP and the actor and that's it for your department, you know, put those headphones on, listen to what is being recorded, and if it works for you, if it sounds good, it is good. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, let's just go through these as okay. fast as we can. Um, and I don't want to, uh, let's see, this one's from Terry. Do you have any specific tips for users who are limited to using you know, Final Cut 6 and 7 for sound mixing right now? I mean, they're, they're post-production fixing, I and mean, this is what they got. And uh, they don't have you, they don't have Pro Tools, they don't have the uh, the, uh, the so-called professional uh, fix-it uh, post-fix. <laughs> they have Final Cut. Right. Uh, what can they do? Um, well, I, I edit in Final Cut six, so I kind of know. I mean, if you're good, if you're creative, well, they with, have Soundtrack um, Pro most mm -hmm. likely. You know, I, I haven't used Soundtrack Pro because I do Pro Tools. I mean, if you go to, I don't know where you are, Terry, but if you go to any film school that teaches sound, you can probably get some students who would be more than happy to take your OMF from your Final Cut and 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 edit and mix it. But if you end up doing it yourself, you want to try to keep the same takes on the same tracks. In other words, don't keep mixing up 25 Apple Take 3 with 25 Boston Take 2 and then 25 Apple Take 3 again. Put, put the ones on a different track. I mean, you can edit that way, but if you're going to try to mix it or do it yourself, try to think of the noise floor and continue the noise up to the line of dialogue. So let's say your picture cut is... To, you know, a second before the sound cut, if you keep the ambience of the one take going up to where the actor actually starts talking, that will help hide the sound difference on the cut. So that's a, a little hint. Okay. So this is from Tim. Uh, when recording an interview, I use an Omni mic on an aluminum boom, and I picked up a radio station along with my dialogue. <laughs> Can you explain why this happens? <laughs> I guess it's frequencies. Um, as I say, I'm I'm not you know real savvy with production you know, with the with the tech technical stuff of things. I just know when it doesn't sound right. So it could be a frequency. I'd have to ask ask my uh, mixer friends about that. It but, probably uh, is. I mean, there are certain yeah. places in Los Angeles, uh, outdoor locations that you just mm -hmm. don't want to go to, especially when you're yeah. using wireless labs. Like, there's certain places in Griffith Park. Right. If you move, like, what, 15 feet from that, that location you are, you will not pick up oh. somebody else's uh, wireless who because they're right. they fil there's filming going on all right. over the place. Right, you just have to cha keep changing frequencies till until right. so you find something that works. I mean, I I shot a wedding where it was all fine before the wedding started, and I went to put the lava on the rabbi, and suddenly I got all this noise, and it was because the the temples had their own monitors at a certain frequency that I I was also at, so it canceled each other out. So. Okay, um, Jeff asks best place for online training. Do you know of uh, any uh, hmm. online training for uh, for hmm. production sound and uh, post-production sound. Hmm. Uh, online training. Oh, I, um, I don't. You know what you yeah. should do? 
to. <laughs> There what? probably there probably is. There I mean, probably is. Linden.com has probably got yeah. uh, uh, something going. on. I mean, on. the best place is just to go out with your equipment and record stuff, and then put it into your editing system and edit it and see what you did wrong. You know, um, there's nothing like on on the job training. Uh, go to film schools. Go go. You know, they're always shooting things, and they always need people to come and help shoot stuff. So that's what I would suggest. But I I'm sorry, I don't know any online places to learn that. Okay. Um, are there any tricks? This is from Mike. Are there any tricks to uh, make a body mic not sound muted like a body mic? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it depends on where you're where you're hiding it. Um, you know, if you're hiding it under silk clothing or uh, under a nylon jumps, if the, if the material doesn't breathe, neither will the mic. So again, if it sounds good, it is good. You just you put it somewhere where. Number one, you're not going to see it, and number two, you want it as close to the the middle of your chest as possible, because that's where your you know the sound is resonating the best. Um, and just try to you know do it so that it doesn't move. But the the best solution is to try to use a boom. A boom mic is always preferable over a body mic. Body mics, you know, things happen. They go out in the middle of the take, and if you're doing a really sensitive scene and your mic goes out then you're kind of screwed. <laughs> this is from uh, Jill. Um she you you had mentioned this that one mic might be better for females than than mm -hmm. and another mic might be better for for males. Can you talk a little bit more about that or is um, that just based on on experience are we are we still dealing with that that issue or is that an issue? Um, it's really just the way certain mics pick up uh, certain voice. I mean, yes, if a, if a, if a man has a, a higher pitch voice, then it'll be the same issue. It, it has to do with the frequencies. Male have more bass in their frequencies than women do. So again, so remind us what's it's a better a, the, mic for The female a... voices often do better with a Shep's mic and male voices are better with Sennheiser's. But again, you know, if it's you know, if you if you have the money to pay for a three thousand dollar boom mic, then <laughs> you know you want to try to get one that's uh, multi-use, or you hire people who have that equipment. Sometimes you can make really good deals with mixers and boom operators for even on a small budget production, you know, for the rental of their equipment along with them. If they're not busy, they'll be happy to work a day or two on a on a low budget or freebie project. Because I do the I do these freebies and low budgets all the time myself, so I I know I know what it's like being out in the field doing stuff. Okay, um, you had mentioned that uh, that doc from the sound department that uh, the, all the sound department guys mm -hmm. wrote, and it's uh, it, is it a is it a book or is it a document? No, he I think he just he just wrote that because he's an instructor. Doug Vaughn is an instructor at USC, and he uses that in his class. I don't know if it's in a book or is not. It, is it freely available? Yeah, or, I mean I can send it. Okay, to so people that's going to uh, yeah. well, Blair just said it's going to okay. be part of the on-demand webinar. Oh, okay, good. And uh, can we Google it? Is it online? Anywhere? Um, not that I know of. No. Oh, I mean, really? I, I, he sent it to me, and I put it in the presentation. So, um, okay. Again, uh, I'm uh, sure he's happy to share it. So, so. again, the, the the audience that is listening uh, today at, to this uh, to this webinar uh, doesn't they don't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a little quick story back when I was an actor, um, doing a lot of television, a lot of films. We did the best we could with with fixing it on set before we have to go to to ADR and I can't stress enough how important that was especially to the actor who's got that in his head uh, if there's a plane that went over that brilliant take that you did if you can get that thing fixed on set uh, 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 well yeah a lot of times you can if you know that there's a sound that's interfering with a, a take that was really good then you turn off the camera, get everybody quiet, and just have the actor say the lines right. again as a wild track. And that way, there, when I worked on Mr. Go Looking for Mr. Goodbar, Richard Brooks, the director, wanted uh, Richard Gere to have this music playing while he did this little dance in his tidy whities and then one of the knife dance, and he's running all over the kitchen. And they played the music for the take on camera, and then he immediately turned the camera off, turned the sound recorder on, and said, okay, do the same thing again. And we were able to almost match, you know, hit for hit and vocal for vocal that wild track into the picture take. And then they were able to add, you know, better music on top of it. So think about, you know, getting a wild track, um, being conscious. Of, I mean, it's almost more important for you to be conscious on the set when you don't have a lot of money because you don't have time to do ADR you know, or money to do ADR. And I'm telling you, the film schools, like Video Symphony is very cooperative with the filmmakers. You know, you can come there and say, hey, I have a film. Uh, you can come to me and say, hey, I have a film that needs sound done on it. 
I, I put my grad students on, I put current students on depending on the project. Sometimes they get, you know, a couple hundred bucks to do it and it gets mixed and everybody's happy. So there there yeah, are a lot, solutions. A lot of people can't afford uh, right. an ADR stage. No, you know, we'll, no. You know, if they want well, to do ADR, where are they going to do it? In their closet? Yes, I've done ADR in my closet, yes. <laughs> with my with my Zoom recorder, I have done it. Again, if it sounds good, it is good. I've done a lot of, uh, I did a whole movie where we shot with a camera that was too loud to record production sound. It's called Her Need for Speed. You can find it on online on YouTube. And I did all the sound after. We shot MOS, which means mit out sound. And I was able to record the sound on my Zoom and add it in later. I mean, because I know how to do that. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a choice, you know. So you, you can record quality sound on these little $300 Zooms. You can even get them for $150 used. And uh, you get good stereo recordings. And you just match it. You can put it in your final cut session. You can put it any anywhere. Uh, you know, a lot of people are shooting with DSLRs, and mm -hmm. they're, they're, and they're, because they have no budget, they're sh using right. the onboard microphone. I mean, you can get uh, road mics and, and stick them on. Also, they can't afford a, a boom operator. They can they, they have to deal with right. what they got. Right. You can got. you can do it. You can do it all yourself. Um, you know, if you're going to use camera sound and the camera mic then the camera has to be as close to the actor as possible, which may not be good for your shot. Right. So what a lot of people do, and what I do with my camera, is I have that beach tech that I showed you the slide of. I hook in um, um, a lav, you know, cheap lav. I run that, you know, into it goes right into the camera. Um, it, you know, bypasses the camera sound. It becomes the camera sound. And it's, it's a very cheap way to get good sound. And then you can, you can sync up that. I've shot also with Canon, Canon 5Ds and 7Ds, and you record the camera sound, but you also record just wild. Um, you run a zoom uh, with the mics. You can hook the mics right into the zoom, and uh, you can do a, a lav and a boom right into that zoom. <laughs> Sounds like it rhymes, but yeah. um, and and then you in Final Cut using Pluralize, Pluralize will match the waveforms of the the camera sound and the separate source sound, and that's why the clapper is so good because it gives it a really strong start. Um, and but it will match waves. You don't even need a clapper, really. It's just the clapper's I insurance. Okay. So um, yeah. Now you t you talked to well. No, let me. I have so many questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. We'll get to that in the podcast part. I'm going to get through a few more of these before we have to uh, to wrap it up. Um, a lot of really good questions here, folks. Thanks. Um, Oh, can you, uh, this is from Alec. Uh, can you tell us some tips on on, on avoiding echo on location? Mm. It's that kind of reverby sound that that uh, you often hear, well, <laughs> especially e with yeah. onboard camera mics. <laughs> um, echo is usually the result of the mic not being close enough. So if the mic is close enough to the voice and it's directional and it's pointed at the voice, then you shouldn't get that echo unless you're shooting in a warehouse with no ceiling, like I was mentioning. But the echo comes from the mic being too far back. If you're relying on the camera mic and you're back enough for a master shot, that mic is not going to pick up you know, close-up dialogue very well. So just move the mic in closer. Uh, any recommendations for, uh, this is an equipment thing, and I know you're not... Uh, uh, production a lot, but any recommendations for on-set headphones? Ah, well, Sony's are good. Uh, anything that's kind of closed around your ears, um, like when I'm you editing... Don't, you don't I, need a $2,000 set of headphones. No, no, but, you know, a good, you know, a $100 pair of headphones, that would be good, okay. you know, and uh, just make sure that they're enclosed enough so you're, you, so you're really hearing what's going into the mic and not all the, you know... Off-camera noises. Yeah, you're talking about the, uh, the the lads versus the booms, and you were when you were always mentioning boom mics. You're saying it's three thousand dollar boom mic. I mean, is there anything cheaper than that? that if you're um, going to use a boom, yeah, there are. I mean, I have a I have a Rhodes mic, um, okay. and uh, I think it was like uh, maybe a hundred or two hundred dollars, um, and I can hook that into my Zoom, as I said. But you you have to know the the directional because there's there's a whole point in in using a directional mic that you you have to reject the bad sound and, and aim it at the sound you want. So some of them are very narrow directionally, so they really have to be aimed right at the actor's um, voice box and uh, back and forth. So that's why rehearsing is so good, so that you know how to do it. A lot of people, I think, rely on lavs because they want to make sure they catch everything, but lavs have a very um, you know tiny sound. I, I had one question that said, um, how do you make a... Uh, a boom sound like a lav, and my answer would be, why would you ever want to? 
but I think it's they're saying I want it to sound close up like a love. Right. And that's really the boom operator, you know. I mean, if you are the boom operator, I've had one guy who does the mixing and and booming himself on on my sets. It's one guy, I pay him like 300 bucks for the day or so and um, you know, I I get good I make sure to get good sound. Um David asked, well, this this I don't know. David asked, can you use the um Let's see the room tone recording to subtract out the undesirable ambient noise. Let's say the, the, the refrigerator noise or air conditioning noise. Right. Yeah. You want to. What, what software would you use? Is it? Uh, well, you know, if if that ambient noise is under dialogue, then yeah, having more of it is helpful because then it it makes a constant uh, noise. You know, any constant noise, you tend to, your ear will tend to yeah, as long minimize. As it's constant. <laughs> as if it's constant, if it's cutting in and out, that's when you start noticing it. So when it's smooth, even if it's bad noise, if it's smooth, your ear will kind of, you know, tone it out. But that's what um, Isotope, I I Z O T O P E, Isotope is a program, um, and it will. Um, you can even get a demo of it if you need to. It's uh, I don't know, like a couple hundred dollars if you're working in Pro Tools. It will help to minimize the background noise without affecting the voice too much. Okay, yeah. a lot of the a lot of our audiences are doing documentaries, mm -hmm. and that's really really tough yeah, to prepare yeah. for, right? There is yeah, no rehearsal. There right, is no <laughs> right. It's, documentaries, yeah, are their own animal for sure, and and also give us we some tips. we also accept more ambient noise problems from documentaries because it's you know quote unquote real. Um, and I, even with that, I think you can, if you have to shoot, um, uh, yourself, uh, you know, get a, a, get a kind of an extended mic off your camera. Um, some mics even have a zoom capability. When you zoom in on your camera, it zooms in the mic. Um, I don't, I don't know which ones those are right now. You can probably research that. Um, or you, you, if you know you're going to do an interview with somebody for documentary, put a lav on them or, right. or, you know, hang the boom over them. You know, you try to control what you can control and then, you know, make up the difference where you can. I mean, yeah. a lot of things, you know, a lot of things can be fixed in post for sure because we, we're always trying to fix things. That's our job. Um, but, you know, if you can anticipate something, like you're going to have a sit-down interview on a, on a doc, then mic them. Okay. We're going to have a, we have time for about a couple more questions before we have to wrap this up. Okay. And um, there are quite a few more to go here, but we will... I promise, folks, uh, in the uh, podcast that we do after this, that you will uh, hear in a, a couple of days, uh, and we'll get to the rest of your questions. Um, let's see. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Oh, somebody asked uh, about: uh, Do you have a favorite sound effects library that you use besides your own? <laughs> Um, I mean, do you have any recommendations where people go to get uh, uh, their sounds? I mean, there's tons of them out there. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, um, since I mostly do production dialogue nowadays, I'm I'm not up on all the the cool uh, the cool sound effects libraries. I know um, Sound Ideas was one of them, and um, what's the other ones? I can't think of. Um, I'll, I'll, I can I can think of them later. But uh, if if you have uh, access to a Zoom or any kind of other uh, you know, device, go out and record your own. There's yeah. nothing like getting fresh new sounds because everybody has the same like door close for a car, you know, <clears throat> and use a different door close for the front doors of the cars and the back doors. Don't use the same clump, 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 you know. <laughs> uh, but go ahead and make make your own library, especially for your own project. You can go through and say, oh, I need, I need a 62 Falcon with, uh, you know, in and stop and dirt, skids and stuff. You can do some of your own recording. Um, well, let's let's ask this one because this is fun. This is from uh, Veda. Has uh, Vicky heard complaints from production mixers about the camera DP department <laughs> tweaking the lighting all the way up until <laughs> that director says action? Because it happens quite often. Mm. And this goes back to collaboration and talking to each other, right? Exactly. Um, and there's also along. there's also a thing that I just discovered that some cameras have an automatic gain control on them. So even if you have a mixer on the set who's recording right into the camera, that camera is going to be might, maybe adding 10 to 12 dBs of, of uh, signal and oftentimes ends up making the dialogue distorted. And then that goes to the picture editor and they edit with that and then they send us the AAF or OMF tracks and we think that's the only track. But you have to do your homework and go back to the sound reports from the mixer and see what he, actually, he or she actually recorded and sometimes we have to substitute those takes for bad 
tracks. They're not always bad, is what I'm saying. And I'm I'm happy to answer any questions if you guys want to email me. Yeah, um, we're just about to ask you that because a lot that. of people want to talk to you. Okay. <laughs> they want your contact info. All right. And, I'm, uh, I'm happy to. Uh, are you happy to give it? I am. Should uh, uh, well, we can give it here uh, for those of you who are listening, and then it'll also be available. I'm assuming at Moviola.com or Blair will get it to you. Okay. So uh, for right now, is uh, do you have a website or uh, um, I don't want you to get inundated with uh, that's email. Right. I'm, I get inundated anyway, but. Oh. It's all right. Um, I just sent an email address, V Sampson, V S A M P S O N, at AOL.com. Oh, cool. You're one of the few. I know. I'm just a few AOL, AOL persons. Hey, stick left. with it, man. It's awesome. Yeah. awesome. So thanks so much. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Victoria Sampson, that was, that was awesome. It's a ton of information for all of us to assimilate. And thank you all. My name is Michael Horton. I'm your host, and I will see you and talk to you next Tuesday.